This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. This Master Brewers podcast is proudly sponsored by Hopsteiner, a global leader in the hop industry focused on quality, sustainability, and innovation in new hop varieties and hop products. Contact our brewery sales team to provide you with the hop-related tools you need to craft your next great beer. For more information, visit hopsteiner.com. Additional support provided by... Get to know Proximity Malt. We malt superior, European-style, low-protein varieties grown close to home in Delaware and Colorado. Domestically grown, precisely malted to style. With our team of seasoned experts and two brand-new malt houses, try what's really new in malt. Check us out at www.proximitymalt.com. Additional support provided by... The secret to quality fermentation is White Labs. Core strains are made weekly and most can ship out the next day. Order through the White Labs app or yeastman.com. Visit whitelabs.com backslash whitelabs for a new customer special offer. That's whitelabs.com backslash why whitelabs. I'll just make a bold statement that lower color expectations are the enemy of malt flavor. And they really restrict, a lower color really restricts the maltster's range of processing options. This week on the show, we replay one of my favorite episodes, which originally aired in February of 2017. Industry veteran Joe Hertrick talks about malt flavor development and why the base malt used by lots of craft brewers isn't the best choice for all malt beers. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode that you won't want to miss. Kilning is, is, is part of the malting process, is the part of the malting process where uh, the vast majority of, of flavor uh, is developed. So I'd like to kind of focus our conversation on that. Um, and most of our listeners probably already have a, a decent uh, understanding of, of kilning and the rest of the malting process. But for those who need a, a little refresher, could you uh, cover some of the terms we're, we're probably going to get into, such you know, things like withering and curing and break point and, and how those uh, kiln phases interact with, with flavor as we, as we get through this discussion about uh, kilning and, and flavor development? Okay. Okay. Good. Let's. Uh, I'll make sure we cover that. Um, and I'm glad. I'm glad we're bringing this topic um, topic up, John, because I, let, let me start by some with some comments of just how critical um, kilning is. Um, it, it's the part of the process, as you stated, it's the most important for flavor and aroma and color development. But we all know as brewers that color can be measured. But flavor and aroma are not really defined by numerical analysis. Um, and um, in the case of malting, there, the flavor and aroma is defined by the kilning technique, not by a numerical spec. And if you really want to uh, understand and, and try to stabilize the flavor in your malt, you really have to understand technique and you got to re- got to have a dialogue with your maltster. The other things I would say that make kilning um, a little more difficult to understand, it represents, in my observation, the most diversity in equipment and process approach in malt plants. Um, over the over the years being in and out of all the malt plants in the United States, um, you know, the, the approach at, at steeping and germination is pretty straightforward. There's different sizes and shapes of equipment, but really the there's general agreement and understanding of the process approach and the process goals. But there's much more diversity in kilning equipment and approaches and ideas about kilning among malting technical people. 
The other thing we have to recommend, and, and this sometimes uh, the business realities get into technical processing, the kilning represents the most energy intensive process in the malt plant. This is where uh, malting itself is a very energy intensive process. Uh, this is where most of the energy is, is expended, um, both electrical energy for, fans, for fan power and uh, for burning fossil fuels. And I guess the final thing I'd say is if, if you're a brewer and you go to a malt house, this is the equi- the kilning equipment is the most difficult to tour. And uh, you just don't easily go in and out of uh, things that are being kilned at 180 degrees um, and with very, very, very high air flows. So it, it's it's a little bit, uh, little bit more difficult to, um, to master. Now, I want to emphasize when we talk about some some comments here, John, we're talking only about kilning operations, malts that can be made um, on a kiln. And they're basically malts that can be used as base malts for um, for all malt brewers. Now, again, there's several challenges to when you want to start having a flavor discussion. The first one I, I mentioned already is it's just not defined by a, a quantitative spec. And if you don't have a uh, a flavor definition uh, in place with your maltster, he's going to run his kiln to his needs, which is stay on schedule, be energy efficient, hit the numbers that they do have, which is just moisture, color, and don't destroy DP. And you have to have that dialogue with your maltster if you want to really focus on um, on flavor. Let's talk about some of the um, the interactions between flavor and color and enzymes. It, it, the first thing we have to understand that that whenever we start into anything about flavor, color and enzymes and flavor are com- are linked together. Um, if you if you're going to have more flavor, it's not possible on very low color malt or on very high enzyme malt. Because if you're going to have more flavor, you're going to apply more heat. And the, 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 the formation of, of flavor compounds parallel the, flavor of the, the formation of color compounds. So you can't have a flavorful malt that's pale. Um, and also, as you apply more heat, you destroy enzyme. So you can't have a high enzyme malt that's flavorful. So, for instance, when you look at some general malt types, like for instance, distiller's malt, um, that that is that that is kilned with very low temperatures. It stays below 140 degrees all the time, and it has very low color, very low flavor, but very very high enzyme. Okay. Um, some of the other higher kiln malts, like pale ale malt and Vienna malts, um, they have higher heats applied to them, and they can they are accompanied by uh, the flavor is accompanied by more color and some enzyme destruction. So, just a starting point before we get into um, get into the exact flavor mechanisms, I want to make sure everybody understands that there's an interaction between color and enzymes and flavor and you can't pick out uh, independently and say i want a very flavorful pale malt or i want a very high enzyme um flavorful malt there's some there's trade-offs as as we go through this so um let me start with the um the key flavor activities that occur on a kiln and then we'll come back to how do you put those flavor activities in different sequences to create different malts? First of all, I'd say a statement that there's very little flavor creation activity below 140 degrees. There's virtually no color, and it's for the maximum preservation of diastatic power, but there's no flavor. Okay. Now, this is, if you're, anybody is familiar with basic distiller's malts, that's how they're made. They're not exceeding 140 degrees. Uh, they're very pale in color, and they have virtually all of the DP that was produced during germination preserved. So, if we took the same green malt out of the last day of germination and put it through a distiller's cycle, on the kiln, never exceeding 140, we might get 140 degrees, we might get a 220 DP. Took that same green malt and put it through a, a, a pale brewer's malt 
um, kiln cycle, we'll get a, a DP of 140. That's just the nature of uh, kilning malt. So as a starting point, nothing really happens till you get to 140 degrees. Now, the next, the, the, the next color reaction or flavor reaction we'll call enzyme conversion, and this is to produce Maillard reaction precursors. Now, this occurs at the enzyme conversion at the same temperatures that we have conversion at the brewery, 145 to 155, same as in the mash. And well-modified malt already has a lot of simple amines. That's one of the Maillard precursors. This conversion, enzyme conversion process, if you emphasize it on the kiln, will produce the other um, Maillard precursor, simple sugars. So this is, this is a step that you either emphasize or de-emphasize to make um, Maillard reaction precursors. And that occurs between 145 and 155. Uh, another uh, independent um, flavor reaction is the Maillard reaction. This is a, a non-enzyme condensation reaction that joins simple amines and simple sugars. And, you know, it starts in, um, if, there's, if there's precursors around, it starts in the same temperature range as conversion, but the reaction speed accelerates uh, as the temperature accelerates. But it's not an enzyme process. It's just a reaction that joins uh, simple amines and simple sugars. The, I, think, um, I think when I was in school, yeah. they always referred to that as non-enzymatic browning. Is that is that's that right? That's, exa that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then another temperature, key temperature point, is the elimination of green and grassy flavors. I, I put this in here because you know flavor, flavor development sometimes is the creation of desirable things. But also flavor development is the elimination of undesirable things. And you can have that raw, that cucumber, grassy, raw grain flavor, greenness that's in that's in malt that has to be kilned to drive that off. And and this normally occurs in the 175 to 185 range. Another thing that, that happens to eliminate a negative, if you can achieve 185. For a, for a fair amount of time, you can eliminate all lipoxygenase activity. This always fascinates me that why we pursue loxanol or lipoxygenase-free barleys when it's so easy to eliminate um, on the kiln. The next uh, the next reaction that's really critical, and this is this is is where the it's the it's the melanoidin formation that is a reaction that takes the Maillard reaction products and at higher temperatures um it'll 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 turn it'll turn the maillard products into melanoidins and this occurs at higher temperatures and when there's lower moisture on the kiln and and melanoidins are really key flavor components in food they're aromatic brown compounds that are necessary for malt flavor and aroma and the light the very light melanoidins would be the flavors that are reminiscent of baked goods um bread crusts uh crackers biscuits a uh, toast when you when you make a piece of toast those kind of very light those are those are light melanoidins they're just they're very pleasant and aromatic and have some color to them the very dark melanoidins when you really apply a lot of heat to them are the things that are in that um, we recognize as coffee um or bitter chocolate um those are dark melanoidins uh, from a lot more uh, heat application or even like toffee and things like that right yeah, they they would be in the middle. They would be in the middle someplace. I don't consider toffee, like for instance, as dark and as intense a melanoidin as coffee. Right. But it's certainly much more than a bread crust. Then I want to mention other one other thing that does not occur on the kiln, and this is something that we for just for for accuracy, um, we should never refer to any malt that's made on a kiln as caramel like or has a caramel flavor, because. Um, Truly, caramelization of sugar 
doesn't really take place until you're above 320, 340 degrees, and it's those the temperatures are slightly different for slightly different sugars for dextrose or fructose. So you can't ever achieve that temperature on a kiln. So we shouldn't make the mistake of calling a kiln malt, make malt. It shouldn't be a flavor aroma descriptor. Caramel should not be a descriptor for any caramel made malt because that requires much higher temperatures. And that, and that would be in a roaster. So if we had these things and we wanted to pull them together into how would you, how would you take these flavor reactions and put them together into a process to make a, a different malt. Uh, and I, I just want to, before I finish that, when all those temperatures I, I mentioned, those are temperatures that have to be achieved in the grain. Um, because when you, when you look at a kiln, there's all kinds of temperature probes all over it. Uh, and one of the temperature probes is coming off the burners and what we call applied air, the uh, temperature of the air being applied to the grain. Um, and then there's a temperature probe coming off the grain, um, which would uh, infer the temperature that's in the grain because it's the air temperature leaving the grain bed. In some cases, there's temperature probes in the grain bed themselves. But whenever I talk about a temperature and achieving it for flavor, it has to be achieved um, in the grain. So if we want to apply these flavor reactions and, and, and um, to kilning, we, we probably should bring in then some, some kilning basics, uh, that what you asked me to touch on in terms of what's withering and what's curing and, and what's break point, uh, because this is important um, to, to, to look at these basics and how they interact with flavor. First of all, you'll hear maltsters talk about all the time the withering phase. This is this is um, free drying, mostly of surface moisture on the green malt. It's the beginning of the kilning flave, and it's generally can be done with high air flows and relatively low temperatures. And um, what it's characterized by is the high air flows are taking all the surface moisture off. And the the um, moistures will come from forty five percent after germination down to maybe twelve to fifteen percent to get all the surface moisture off, and it'll be a very uh, high saturated air, high humidity air that's that's coming off it during this phase. And then the second phase, that what's called the curing phase or the bound drying, is taking that second part from after you've reached. Uh, 12 to 15 percent down to four percent now this is much harder drying this is bound moisture reduction not surface moisture reduction and now because you're you're, you're um, really um, cooking and curing the malt this is when you start to get some flavor drop or some flavor development and here when you um have air coming off the kiln now it um it drops in humidity and the temperature of it goes up and um it's uh, not fully saturated anymore so this 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 point between withering and curing to um to monsters is called break point or breakthrough and they they define that break point as when all the malt in the kiln completed the withering phase and all the surface moisture is gone and the moisture in the, on the malt is down to 12 or 15 percent um, and it's broken through now and then the temperature sharply increases coming through and you can raise the temperature of the malt much more easily. Now this uh, in kiln economics uh, maltsters will tell you that first phase will use up half the energy. They'll only use half the energy to get from 46 down to 12%, but they'll use the other half of the energy that's used on a kiln just to get from 12 to 4. Now, these are important because um, the withering phase is lower temperature, but there's much higher moisture still in the malt. And the curing phase is the temperature is going up, but the moisture is very, very low. And this is important because the um, the flavor and aroma and color development, they're a combination of the temperature and the time on the kiln, but they're also very much a function of the green malt moisture at the time of the heat application. So um, if we if we talk about a couple of different um, a couple of different malt types um, and how this uh, goes together, 
If we talk about the most common pale malt, and this is kind of the standard of the adjunct brewers, the U.S. pale malt, um, and this would also be um, internationally would be English lager malt or German pills, there's supposed to be a minimum amount of flavor development here. So they have very rapid, low temperature airflow till breakthrough. In other words, it's, t it's dried with air more so than with temperature. So the process of keeping the temperature down and drying with air minimizes the enzyme reactions and minimizes Maillard reactions. So there's very little in the way of precursors that are formed. And then it's cured um, up to um, about 175 to 185 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, just the temperature that's right on the borderline of driving out the, um, the green and grassy notes. Now, this is the procedure that will give you the very lowest color malt, but it will also give you malt that's a high DP and the locks in it will still be active. And this is the standard expectation of the adjunct brewer because he wants to preserve the DP and he wants to make a, have a very low color for a very low American pale lager. Now, the negative side of that, though, is the flavor notes, if, if the final curing around 185 is not effective in getting all the way through the malt, You'll, you'll, you'll see there'll be no trace of melanoidins at all, and you'll have a slight green and slight grainy and slight weak aroma. And, and the thing that I can, I'm concerned about is that's probably, that's the standard of pale adjunct beers in the United States, but it is most likely not the best base malt for all malt craft brewers. But it is the standard if you don't go further and ask for anything different on the kilning, it would be the standard U.S. Um, two-row brewer's pail. And I think craft brewers have much more flexibility um, to, um, to, to, to use um, more malts because more different types of malts as base malt because, and remember, this is a high DP, 140, which is not necessary uh, for um, for craft and all malt brewing, and it has a pale color, but um, but we're going to create a lot of amber and darker beers that are going to have special malts in them anyway, so that color is not really material. I think uh, all malt brewers should look at some other um, base malt types that would be stronger um, in flavor than the typical um, U.S. Uh, brewer's pale. Coming up. To me, color is color is can be one of the most misused specifications that uh, it really gets in the way of flavor. And in the case of if it lowers modification, it really gets in the way of functional malt and, and high extracts. I'm John Bryce, and you're listening to the Master Brewers Podcast from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. Support for this podcast is brought to you by ABS Commercial is a full-service brewery and parts outfitter. From our Raleigh headquarters to our Denver office, we proudly offer brew houses and fermenters from three barrels and up, yeast brinks, boilers, kegs, chillers, tri-clamp, and other stainless parts, all with the quickest delivery and lead times in the industry. Learn more at abs-commercial.com or call 877-BREW-ABS. ABS Commercial. We are brewers. Additional support provided by Bring the world to your brew house with BSG's diverse selection of ingredients and services. Our dedicated customer service team and industry experience provides you with the assistance you need every step of the way. Make BSG your supplier of choice with products essential to making great artisanal beverages so you can stay focused on your craft. Visit us at bsgcraftbrewing.com or contact us at 1-800-374-2739. Here's what's coming up on the Master Brewers calendar. Don't miss the CO2 monitoring in the Brewery and Brew Pub webinar June 13th. District Philly's annual golf outing is June 14th. District Midwest meets at Wolf's Ridge Brewing in Columbus June 29th. 
Don't miss the July 10th safety webinar, Lockout Tagout, It's the Law. The District Michigan Summer Social is July 13th at Fitzgerald Park in Grand Ledge. District St. Paul, Minneapolis joins forces with the Minnesota Craft Brewers Guild once again for the Minnesota Brewers Conference July 26th in Duluth. The District Texas Summer Meeting in Kerrville is the weekend of August 2nd. Master Brewers Brewery Systems Technology and Maintenance Course starts August 18th in Madison. And the District Ontario Hop Field Day is August 24th at Goodlot Farmstead Brewing Company. It's time to start making plans for the 2019 Master Brewers Conference. If you can only make it to one conference in 2019, this should be it. We're really mixing things up this time and heading to the Calgary Convention Center to see how Alberta celebrates Halloween. Check out the full calendar events at mbaa.com for more details or to find a district meeting near you. Now back to the show. I think one of the strongest um, base malts would be um, English pale ale malt, a truly, a true process English pale ale malt. Now, that starts out with exactly the same process as the uh, as the U.S. pale and, and the German pills. It has a very rapid and low temperature airflow till break process, till breakthrough. And the process, again, minimizes enzyme conversion. It minimizes Maillard reaction. But the difference is it's then cured at a much higher temperature than U.S. pale malts. It'll go up to 195. Uh, 195 to maybe 220 degrees um, of finish kilning, but only at the very end when the moistures are very low. Now, what this does then is this will give a much darker color, probably twice the color. If a if a if a U.S. pale is 1.8, you could get pale malts that are 3.6, uh, pale ale malts that are 3.6 in color. Also, it'll have a lower moisture. It's not unusual in the UK to have pale ale malts delivered less than 3% moisture. That's just the nature of that intense finish kilning. Uh, the DP will re be reduced, possibly by 40, uh, 50 units. So if you use this procedure on a, on a US malt uh, that has 140 uh, in, the, in the pale version, you might get a 90 or 100 um, DP out of it. The locks will have been completely destroyed, so there's no lipoxygenase in it. But the real value is um, the um, flavor notes. There's now no raw grain flavors whatsoever. And what's in there, because melanoidins, the, the, the light melanoidins were formed out of a little bit of natural Maillard reaction there was. There was no emphasis on making... Um, on, on making an enzyme conversion or making a lot of Maillard products. So you get the, the flavor attributes of toasted and biscuity, really nice, light, reminiscent of baked goods flavor. But it's just so much cleaner, and all the green, grassy, and uh, weak aromas have been eliminated. So it's a very strong malt. Because we uh, have plenty of enzymes, um, and in an all-malt process, down to 75 DP will support an all-malt process, it's really a good, um, it's really a good application for an all-malt brewer's, craft malt brewer's uh, base malt. So, and he, Joe, yeah. let me interrupt you for a second. There's yeah. two things I wanted to, to ask about. The first thing is, I just wanted to clarify, um, just so there's no confusion to our listeners, when, when you're referring to, um, you know, a U.S. Uh, two-row pale versus yeah. a English pale ale malt, we're not talking about different varieties that, that are grown in different countries. We're talking no. about a, a different difference in process only. So, same Correct. barley, different process. I just want to make sure that's clear. Yes, absolutely. And, 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 and you know, there's, there's too much loose use of words um, in in malt descriptors, in marketing descriptions of right. malt. If we stick right with the, the true-to-type processing. Now, John, the English do make a version of this. There's English lager malt. Right. Okay. And that's made like U.S. pale malts or like German pills malts. That's right. And, um, and, and one of the I, reasons I, I mm -hmm. think you've uh, indicated that, you know, this this type of malt, this this English lager malt or, or U.S. pale malt, as you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that really was designed for adjunct brewers, right? I mean, because they, they needed the higher DP, right? Yes, absolutely. 
and it, you know the thing that's interesting is it's it's designed you even have to put a fine point on that it's designed for adjunct grain brewers because you need the dp to convert other grains corn or rice but a large segment not entirely but a large segment of the u.s adjunct brewing industry has converted to corn syrups so they don't have to convert grain corn or grain rice so they're less interested in dp now only adjunct brewers that use grains are interested in dp the and and alpha and alpha amylase now adjunct brewers that use corn syrup still have to support fermentation so they're interested in things like fan but they don't have a problem with enzymes anymore Hmm. okay so, so there is there is that aversion in England, and, and German pills malts are notoriously they're they're really low. They're almost DMS malt, and I mean, they let you produce a German flavor profile, which which is what grainy and 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 high DMS. So, <laughs> so that's so, but that's made with these German pill malts. Now, in of the on this English pale ale, there there is a there is a close. There is a there is a product like that in the United States. Uh, it, it's generally called hydride malt, um, but it's made that same way as pale ale malt, where you really keep a low profile until you get to very low moisture, and then apply higher heat. But the key the key attributes are you drive out the green grassy flavors. And since you didn't emphasize melanoid and uh, uh, Maillard precursors, you get the light melanoidins, just biscuity and baked goods melanoidins. Uh, but you are going to knock down the DP, and you are going to have a higher color. Now, if you want a little bit more flavor profile, there's if, if you look at another process, which is the Vienna malt process, which... I don't know if they're as common as they used to be, but they're the malts that are used in Marzins and Fest beers in um, uh, in Europe. And what they do is they start in the withering process and have a limited amount of recirculation of air during the withering as the temperature is being increased. And what they're doing is not just recycling temperature they're recycling moisture what they're really doing is not letting the moisture out of the kiln so that you can get more heat to a higher moisture grain during the withering phase and that creates a little bit of enzyme conversion and a higher uh, amount of Maillard reaction and then Go ahead and cure it at a higher heat, not as high as pale ale, but get it up over 195 to 203, 205, and that eliminates the raw grain flavors. But now, because more Maillard reaction was 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 left to happen, you get some of the darker melanoidins, the sweeter um, uh, toasted and aromatic melanoidins. And this is what a lot of people think of as malty flavor, this this type of, uh, of a little bit more sweetness. But it's not the, the, clean, cr- the clean, crisp bread crust or biscuity type of, of uh, flavor that's in a pale ale malt. And then a the fourth type is um, uh, the, the light Munich types. And I, I emphasize light because you want to keep it light enough that you still have DP to carry it as a base malt. But you start with significant recirculation and, and hold when you're still above 25% moisture. And you try to get up to that enzyme um, conversion phase um, uh, in that 145 before the moisture is gone so you can create a much more... Um, Maillard reaction products, and you create significant Maillard reaction products so that when you put finished heat on it and you go up into the 210, 220 range, then you get a more pronounced melanoid and it's malty and it's sweet and it has rich aromatics. And um, if you stay down at like a Munich 10 or something lighter in color, you should have enough DP. The DP will be reduced. There won't be any LOX activity, but you'll have a higher color. It'll start pushing up toward a seven uh, color. Um, but the, the idea is that you can get more flavor um, if you're willing to give up some color and some DP. And I think this is where all malt brewers have a distinct advantage the um, over adjunct brewers where they have more flexibility 
in these malts and being able to um, being able to employ different base malts and get better flavors. They don't have to use the the very pale enzyme rich malts that the uh, the adjunct brewers have to use. So I think those those four basic types and processing, you know, thinking about the ad, the analysis attributes and the flavors, you're you're just always wanting to seek the elimination of those pale those pills type green notes. You always want to get rid of those, and if you want to get the pale ale biscuity notes, you have to get over 195 to uh, to get it toasted and biscuity. And if you want to work in the Vienna and mini Munich, mini Munich type sweet aromatics. You got to get a little bit more heat up on the kiln before the moisture comes down so that there's a little bit of a stewing effect. But still then at the end, you have to apply over 195 to get the, um, the melanoidin products made, the sweet and malty ones. And again, I guess I would, I would have to emphasize again, when we're chasing flavor, we have to accept a higher color. And when we're chasing flavor, we have to accept a lower diastatic power. That's just that's just the nature of the interaction of those things um, on the kiln. Okay, very good. Um, you know, uh, Joe, a lot a lot of brewers out there have a habit, um, good or bad, of specifying um, fairly low colors in, in their base mm-hmm. malts. Um, yeah. What does the malster have to do to actually achieve those lower colors? And and could you talk a little bit more about you know? What happens when, how they're handcuffed when they have to do that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll just make a bold statement that lower color expectations are the enemy of malt flavor. And they really restrict, a lower color really restricts the maltster's range of processing options. First of all, because because the flavor and color reactions are going to have to do with protein and with sugar, uh, simple sugars, the first thing the, 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 that the um, monster does, he has to seek lower protein barley. And, uh, and that's okay, but it's not always available. And uh, he has to, the part that I don't like is he has to, 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 the low color requires lower modification profiles. And because what you're expecting the monster to do is have a lower modification profile that reduces the amount of simple amines that are produced because they're the reaction uh, they're the reaction products that we need later so he starts to to go off toward the direction of i need to reduce my modification i need less products produced that will create color but that hurts overall malt functionality as we discussed in a previous podcast we're probably going to lose extract and we're going to lose malt functionality then the final thing that uh, that really is negative to flavor, he has to he has to have a color controlled kiln profile, low temperatures, high air flows, withering all the way the, through the breakthrough. Make sure there's no Maillard precursor development because that's color and flavor, and you can't separate them. And then he works with a minimum cure temperature and time to avoid any melanoidin formation. So it it risks. Um, green grassy green grassy notes in the malt so it's really it's to me color is color is can be one of the most misused specifications that uh, it really gets in the way of flavor and in the case of if it lowers modification it really gets in the way of functional malt and and high extracts and it's just not it's just not necessary i mean i don't know how many i don't know how many all malt beers are made without the use of some level of specialty malts. So, I mean, I, I just don't, it, it just doesn't make sense to me that there's, that, that you should be forced into this uh, expectation of a 1.6 or a 1.8 color when you accomplish so much more with a 2.5 or a 2.8 color that really won't make any difference in the, in the, in the finished, the construction of the finished recipe. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, now, Joe, we've talked you know entirely so far about malts that were produced on a kiln. How about let's talk about roasters for a second? Can you can you comment a little bit about how processing on a roaster is is different and how that changes uh, the flavors that well, are produced? Yeah, uh, for, let me let me say this, John. First of all, everything that I've discussed about malting up to this point 
or anytime I discuss malting, it's usually because I've done it myself. I have to I have to make a disclaimer here. I've never run a roaster myself, but I know the basics of of roasting. And the first thing I would tell you is that it's very small batch. When you look at the malt pieces that are in kiln, the batches that are in big malt houses on kilns, they range from 200 to 400 ton batches. A large roaster is a five ton batch. So very small batches, um, very short, much shorter cycle. Um, in a in, Even in a single deck kiln that um, is going to produce a piece a day with high air flows, it's probably going to be on the kiln 20 hours. In a double deck kiln, it'd probably be in, in, in process 40 hours, two decks of 20 hours each. A typical roaster cycle is um, much shorter, maybe two and a half to three hours to accomplish what you want on a roaster. But the most important part, the two most important aspects of roasting is that roasting, you can put the batch in the drum and you start applying heat to it and you can heat it without drying it. When you're on a kiln and passing air through the grain on the kiln, you can't heat it without drying it. And the key to roasted malt flavors are you can heat without drying, which means you can apply heat to high moisture grain. In fact, roasters are usually loaded. Most roast, roasted malts are usually loaded directly out of germination at 45% moisture. So heating without drying is very critical. You can do, you can put it right up at, at high moisture. You can put it right up to mashing temperature and you're in effect mini mashing um, in the roaster. And then the temperature, you know. I described the highest number I think I described on a pale malt kiln to make uh, English pale ale was 220 degrees. Roasting is done at somewhere between 350 degrees and 500 degrees, depending on the flavor that uh, or the depth of the color or the depth of the flavor. So this is where you actually do caramelize sugar. And it is correct to talk about uh, burnt sugars and caramelization as flavor attributes on roasted malts. So summarized, small batches, short cycle, but most critical, heating without drying and very, very high temperatures compared to the kiln. Destroys all enzymes. These can never be considered as a base malt. Uh, these all have zero enzyme when they're coming off of the uh, coming off of the uh, roaster. Right, that makes sense. Now, I, I think since we're talking about flavor, um, another interesting topic. I, I've heard a lot of chatter in recent years um, from brewers talking about how flavor has been bred out of North American barley over the years, and mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not sure either of us would, in, would entirely agree with that statement. Um, do you think that barley variety makes a difference in flavor? I think I think the best answer I can give to that, John, is I don't know. I simply don't know. Um, but I can tell you this: uh, first of all, if if they exist, variety difference, variety flavor differences, all else being equal, are very very small. I, I have to. I have to rely on my experience at the largest brewer in the world, where we have spent a lot of time and placed a lot of emphasis on wort tasting, malt wort tasting. And because we were large, we were bringing malt in from virtually every malt house in the United States. So we had a good view of whether um, varieties processed in different malt plants had differences or multiple varieties in a single malt plant had differences and i would tell you from those experiences sitting there tasting is malt plants have a signet have a flavor signature to them sort of a house flavor signature to them we would not be able to determine variety differences for instance if we tasted um five met calves from five different malt houses they'd be they'd have different flavor profiles but if we would taste five two row varieties from a single malt house they would be very similar so and, and in terms of problem solving and troubleshooting we often uh, went out and did work in malt houses because 
of the house flavor profile, but we didn't really do um, any work because we thought a variety had a flavor difference. Let me add one thing about the, the comment about the, um, the barley uh, changes being, and flavor being bred out of it. I can tell you that I'm fortunate that I was the I, my, I represented my company at the founding of AMBA in 1982, and I was a member of AMBA from '82 till I retired, uh, either as a technical a committee representative or as a board member. So I didn't realize I was, it was that young. Yeah, it's only '82 now. It was preceded by another organization, MBIA, the Malting Barley Improvement Association, but that structure. Uh, did, and the brewers got together, brewers and maltsters got together and decided they wanted a new structure with more resources. The previous one was not as well resourced as the current one is, but the current structure was founded in 1982. And I can tell you, I was present at virtually every varietal evaluation and, appro- and approval since 1982, and not one of them was decided on flavor. Okay. The, um, the, 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 there was never an idea or a concept of that we needed to uh, get a blander flavor. There was never a concept of we're tossing this one out because it's too flavorful and, and adjunct brewers want um, more generic barley. The reality is that flavor doesn't enter into the process at all in barley breeding. When, when the barley breeding starts, the, the breeder is, is seeking agronomic improvement. He's seeking yield improvement. He's seeking disease resistant. He's working with only a few barley plants in the greenhouses, in the plots. There's no amount of barley at that point that can go to um, evaluation uh, for flavor. When he gets to the next step, after maybe five or six years, and he's ready to submit a sample, it goes to um, the Agricultural Research Service in Madison, and they do, I believe it's, um, I believe it's 200 grams, it's not even one kilo um, of pilot malting or, or micro, mini malting. And that's just to check the, the malting functionality, the malting characteristics. Will it hydrate? Will it germinate? Will it grow? Will it look like a malt? Will it have enzymes? There's no, there's no, there's no scale there to allow any, um, uh, any flavor testing. The next thing that happens is it gets even bigger. Um, it'll go to pilot molding, which is one kilo. Um, now, um, and it's still at that scale. There's two problems. One, it's to emphasize um, malting characteristics. But there's no small-scale flavor tools for something that's made at a one-kilo size, no small-scale brewing and flavor evaluation. So one of the things that that anybody that makes that statement that it was bred out of it, there was no flavor evaluation at all until we're in like the 12th year of barley breeding. And at that point, then... 50,000 bushels are grown and it goes to a malt house and maybe five rail cars are malt are made and it goes out to breweries. And then they get to evaluate it for the first time, pilot or full scale malting and full scale brewing. And I don't know of any, in, in the length of time I was involved, there was no variety that was rejected on flavor, either good or bad. Hmm. So, so, um, but getting back to, is there, is there, is there a difference? Uh, you know, again, Tasting warts, um, I don't think, I don't know if there is, but if it, it does exist, it's very, very small. Uh, the other thing um, that I would say is that if we did, if, if we can find that variety flavor difference through breeding, it's a long way off because that's a 10 to 15 year cycle of breeding. Let's say we inst- instantaneously found a cross. We had a small scale brewing, uh, brewing uh, uh, and flavor evaluation tool to brew uh, one bottle of beer and uh, had tools to, to make an evaluation and said, we found it. We got it. Well, it'll take 15 years to get that trait through the process, make sure it has disease resistant, make sure it has all these other things. And we'll go through that and we'll end up with what I think is just a very small difference. And I think there's a much more important uh, 
profile, which is the heat applied, the length of time of the heat and the moisture level. I think there's many more tools to make flavor um, in the malt house right now than there is um, uh, than there is to wait for barley breeding. I mean, and again, I guess, and I don't want I don't want to be negative about this, but I would tell you that even if we find it academically proven, might not be process meaningful. Yeah. Is it, if it if it's really that critical to a brewer, do you want to wait 15 years for a small difference? Right. I understand. I understand how, how uh, people feel really strongly about it, and they should pursue things they feel strongly about it. But from a from a pragmatic sense, I think there's a lot more things we can do today in okay. the malt plant. In the malt plant. Yeah, that makes great sense. Um, Joe, what about the legacy varieties? You hear a lot of. Uh People that have been around a while say, oh, you know, Clogus had a better flavor than AC Metcalf or, you know, people seem kind of caught up on. And I guess you see that in in years, too. People always say, oh, it's not as good as it used to be. But, you know, what do you think about that? Well, you know, I thought about that. uh, And and they may, the malts may taste different. But not because of a genetic flavor difference in the malt. But you have to you have to think about the processing differences that have evolved. Clogus, uh, like the European two rows, are still five and six day malting. Clogus was a five day um, malting, so its malting profile was different. So if you if you accept that the degree of modification that you have, and then the heat. Uh, and kilning application do you make develops the flavor if you if you have a variety that has a different level of modification then um it's probably going to make a different tasting malt when you kiln it and to the extreme of this is where again the low color expectation comes into play let's just say that we have clogus that has a a very modest modification profile and a nice a nice kilning profile that set the standard and it was a very nice malt and it was at one at one eight color then we compare that to okay now we have metcalf as a standard well metcalf has a much higher modification profile so it's going to make more simple protein material and it's going to it's going to have a different set of artifacts that are going to go to the kiln Now, if we still have this expectation of making a 1.8 color, how are we going to get those higher modification artifacts through the kiln and still have a 1.8 color? Well, we're going to have a different kilning procedure. We're going to have a, a, a less of a heat application and a different profile to get that through the kiln. And I would say that would be two different tasting malts. Two malts with very different modification profiles. If you're going to have the same color standard, they'll have to be kilned differently. But if you had two different modification profiles, you put them through the same kiln procedure, that second one will have a higher color. This is where I always come back to that um, low color expectation or is the enemy of functional and flavorful malt. So, you know, I think they could taste different, but not for the reason of a genetic component for flavor, that they process differently and they kiln differently. And um, the fact that we have evolved to to different kilning procedures to preserve the 1-8 color expectation could explain the differences in the malt. Very interesting. I, I, I would never, I would never disagree with somebody that says I observed this or I tasted this or I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I used this in the beginning and now it's not the same. But they may not always. We may not always get the cause and effect right. That's but we right. should never. We should never. We should never question anybody's observations. They've they've seen it. We weren't there. <laughs> it's right. their beer and they saw it. We didn't. But there may be alternate explanations for it. That's awesome. Great. Well, Joe. Thanks a lot. Um, okay. You're really full of knowledge here. You need to write a book sometime soon. You know that? I heard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I heard. Well, and we're going to have you back on the podcast again very soon to continue this discussion because um, there's obviously much, much more to talk about in regards to 
barley and malt and and and, and malting and uh then we can possibly fit into just a, a couple hours of, of chatting so um i've heard you even ran out of time during a 16 hour lecture at one point so. <laughs> yeah well thanks very much john because it's uh thanks for the opportunity because i uh I like to share the things that i've observed over the years all right that's what mba is all about right yep all right okay thanks john that was Joe Hertrick here on the Master Brewers Podcast. If you want to hear more from Joe, check out episodes 15, 51, or 88, or just type Hertrick into the search bar at masterbrewerspodcast.com. Are you enjoying the Master Brewers Podcast? Let me tell you about a simple way you can help us keep making more. Take a minute to thank our sponsors. There's no way we could produce this show without generous support from sponsors like Hopsteiner, ABS, Proximity Mall, White Labs, and BSG. So please let them know you heard their message on the Master Brewers podcast and that you appreciate their support. It's time to start making plans for the 2019 Master Brewers Conference. If you can only make it to one conference in 2019, this should be it. We're really mixing things up this time and heading to the Calgary Convention Center to see how Alberta celebrates Halloween. You can find all the details on the Meetings tab at mbaa.com. Stuck, I can't be losing too much and-